Let's try that again. My name is Carmen Yetzi Mazera. I serve as executive director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the fifth annual APSIA Diversity Forum, which we hope will be a great week for you all to explore all of the different possibilities and programs and opportunities in the fields of international affairs. This is the beginning of our conversation and we look forward to staying engaged with all of you going forward beyond just this week. But uh, there's many people to thank for the success of this week and all of the other kinds of opportunities that you're going to see going forward. I wanna start by thanking my team, Melina Perez and Brianna Suarez, who are here to be of assistance to you uh, as we go through and you will definitely hear more from them uh, throughout this week and, and have a chance to see and interact with them. Brianna has kindly put a link to our program for the week in the chat. As you have questions, if you want to learn more about the speakers you're going to hear from, you want to learn more about all of the organizations that have made this week possible, the program is your best resource and hopefully you've seen that already. And that's another group of folks I absolutely want to thank, all of the sponsors and investors who make the DF possible. In particular, we're grateful to the Harvard Kennedy School, Johns Hopkins Sice, McClarty Associates, the Open Society Foundations, Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs, Syracuse Maxwell School, Texas A&M's Bush School, the USC Master of Public Diplomacy Program, and the University of Washington Jackson School for their particular investment in this week and in these activities. Before I turn the floor over to Dr. Natasha Saunders, I want to let all of you know that we do hope this will be a great chance for you to get those questions answered. So as you have them, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll unpack them as we go. I also wanna invite anyone who might need some special accommodation uh, for, for different needs to reach out to us by whatever means are, are useful to you, whether it's email or DM, uh, to let us know how we can make sure this event is as accessible as it can be. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Dr. Saunders and we'll jump in and hear from our wonderful speakers. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you. So hello everyone. Can I get either a thumbs up, a clap, something in the chat so that I know you all are there. You're ready to listen to our amazing panelists. Yes, okay, I'm excited. I see, I see all the thumbs up and the hands clapping. I appreciate that, we all appreciate that. So um, I'm Tasha and I'm a career coach and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel. So in the link, um, in the chat box, all of you all should have um, gained access to the panelist bios. Can I see a thumbs up that everyone has access to the panelist bios? The link is in the chat box. Wonderful, it was also sent out through email. So I highly suggest you take a look, um, open it and download it. I also wanted to share that um, having cameras on is optional, but we would appreciate it. We, we'd love to see smiles. You don't have to be dressed up. We'd just love to see the faces. So every now and again, but if you do need to take a break, we totally understand. There's been a lot this year on camera on Zoom. But I just want you to know that you're welcome to show faces. Um, please keep mics muted. Um, we're going to be taking questions from you all um, once I finish asking a few questions. So you're welcome to uh, begin to make notes or put questions in the chat box so we can take um, a look at those and ask those a little bit later. Let me think, anything else I wanted to share? So we do have three panelists today. We have Kesia is here, Melanie is here, and we have one more panelist, Sarah, but she's gonna be joining um, with us a little bit late. Don't worry, when she logs in, I'll make sure that I'll go ahead and um, ask some questions to her as well. So we're gonna jump into questions, but right before we do, why don't we just have our two panelists just say their names really quickly and just greet you. Just say a quick hello to you and then I'll jump into the questions, all right? Happy to kick off, I'm Kizia McKegg. Delighted to be here uh, and thank you to Apsia for inviting me. Awesome. And I'm Melanie Kawano Chu, calling in from Los Angeles, California. It's lovely to see you all. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, so let's jump into 
our first question, which is about your professional journeys. And so the question is, what was your first job out of undergrad? So you may have to think back, not too far, but what was your first job out of undergrad? How did you get started? Kesia. Okay, happy to, to kick us off here. Um, just by way of background too, I'll add that I'm, I'm calling in here from Washington, DC. I moved here in 2008 after having completed a master's degree overseas. My route was a little more unconventional. Um, I, can, I can give that backstory if you'd like, but my first job in Washington to answer your first question was on the staff of the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee working on uh, a mix of support for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff director on hearing schedules, um, but also uh, working closely with the senior professional staff member for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I had always had a, a, an abiding interest in US policy towards Latin America. This was an amazing first job in Washington to get first experience on Capitol Hill, which is always valuable in a city that centers around government, um, but also given the degree to which the US Congress has uh, influence over our foreign policy making in a unique way in this country, much less so than in other countries. Uh, it was a very good place to have incredible access and, and learn and learn how that influence works, learn the mechanics of the Hill. Um, I think having a, a job and if you're interested in a career around international affairs in Washington, having getting that a government experience at an early age is very useful, even if you go on to do things in the nonprofit or private sectors as I've done since then. But I can I can leave it at that, but can also go into much more detail about how I got there if you'd like. That's excellent. We'll, we'll pause for right now. Thank you. Melanie, let's jump to you and let's everybody put a thumbs up and a wave to Sarah. Sarah Jackson just joined us and we're gonna have her uh, say hello in a moment. So welcome, Sarah. Melanie, please. Thank you, Tasha. So I was um, born and raised in Hawaii and knew pretty early on that I did want to have a career in international affairs, but that I actually wanted something separate from the US federal government. There's a lot we can talk about in another session about Hawaii and the US federal government. Uh, so I actually went overseas in my first job to teach at a university in Northern Vietnam and spent a couple of years there before I went on to graduate school at the University of Denver, the Cordell School, and then did eventually move to DC where I spent about 10 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah, welcome. Please just, you know, just say hello to everyone. They have your bio already, but perhaps just greet our amazing students and you can jump right into the first question, which was, what was your first job out of undergrad? Okay. Um, hi. My internet, I just have to warn you, is, is unstable uh, in today's climate, uh, just broadband issues. They decided no to turn problem. it off in my uh, area. Okay, if you, so if I'm, you also I'm on a hot find spot. That it's if you find that it's easier, you you could uh, close the video if you find it staticky and then we'll just have audio. So just play it by ear. Yeah, is this better? It is, the video? thumbs up everyone. Can you hear her clearly? Okay, great, okay. <laughs> yeah, I actually may even call in, uh, but I'll, I'll do that in a second. Uh, first job out of college was working for, um, the US Congress. Uh, it was a press deputy press secretary for um, Congressman Pete Sessions in Washington, DC. Uh, did that uh, really after trying to figure out if I wanted to go um, and work, uh, um, it will go to grad school, frankly, and, and, and PA um, or you know figure out some other path. And so ended up on Capitol Hill. Shortly after, got a presidential appointment to uh, uh, the U.S. State Department and Public Affairs, and so sort of the rest of my journey. And so it, it wasn't really clear. Um, I've learned a lot in those. It's almost been like over twenty years, I guess. Um, well, yeah, like 
anyway, 15 to 20 years, uh, but it's been a great journey um, and an opportunity to explore and figure out what skills I have and where, where my interests align with that. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. So um, along those lines of a question that came up was about what do you wish you had done? Now that could go in, in a lot of different directions. It could be, what do you wish you had done when you taken your first position? Or is there something within your career that you felt like you've been missing that you wish you would have taken a pivot? So you can take that question in either direction, but I'm gonna also throw one more caveat in there. A lot of students often ask us about getting to the hill. I wanna get on the hill. How do I do that? So if you could add a little bit of more detail about that journey, I think that would be really helpful as well. Would you like me to kick off there? Not <laughs> Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, to be honest, I don't have any regrets on in how my career evolved. Um, and also, to be honest, I never had a grand five, 10 year, 20 year plan. I followed my interests and opportunities fortunately arose um, to meet those interests. Um, I, in fact, apart from that first job in Washington, which I actively searched for and my advice for everybody who wants, probably particularly in Washington, DC, but anywhere you're looking um, is to do informational interviews. I spent probably two months doing informational interviews with uh, starting off with a couple of alumni from my undergrad alma mater, but I grew that network grew exponentially the more people I talked to. And those informational interviews are not about asking for a job, but rather, to learn about opportunities you may have never even heard of, to get advice, to um, more than anything, have people um, keep you on their radar so that when there is a job opening, they contact you. Uh, that certainly worked in my favor. I had three job options to choose from. As I said, I ended up going with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee job opportunity in order to gain government experience. Um, but it, uh, going forward, my two subsequent jobs in Washington um, were the result of people coming to me and recruiting me just based on my own reputation. Um, so that that's often how the work world, including in foreign policy and international affairs works in, in at least DC. Um, but that first job on the Hill, like I said, it was, it, I, I, in some ways I was lucky I was there in, the right place at the right time, just when there was an opening on the committee staff, which is a rare occurrence. Um, and I, I got there because I had an informational interview with a contact of mine and they did not advertise for that job. Um, that's often the case. Um, uh, for other people who wanna work on the Hill, I say, um, just talk to as many people as you can, identify both the committees and the personal offices of members you would be interested in working for. And, and making sure you have some kind of a personal connection. Um, that is in contrast to the other ways to work for the US government, the executive branch, which is very, very different. And we can also get into this. I, at one point, did all of the exams for the US Foreign Service. I passed them. I got invited to join an incoming class of Foreign Service officers. But that was when I was already at my current job and really enjoying it. So I decided to turn that down. But I do know that process very well. Um, and if anybody is thinking at all about the State Department of the Foreign Service, um, I encourage you to take the Foreign Service exam because it's a very long process. You lose nothing. You might as well. Um, but don't wait for that before looking for another job. You need something in the meantime. Um, the other route is through civil service, which, to be honest, I, many of my friends are, are civil servants in the U.S. government, particularly the State Department. The best route for that is, is really through what's called the Presidential Management Fellowship. If you're in graduate school, you probably know about this. You apply for it in your last year of graduate school, and it's a great program to enter the U.S. federal government. You choose a home agency, you have two years, you do rotations in other agencies, and often it turns into a job somewhere else. It most often shoot, um, results in a permanent job at your home agency, I should say. 
Otherwise, it's sort of a black box, <laughs> black hole on usajobs.gov. Um, and I know very few people have gotten jobs in, at the State Department or elsewhere in the federal government through that. Um, that's the world of government. Um, I can leave it at that. But actually, my career is a bit of a testament to the fact that you can very much do a career in international affairs without necessarily going to the State Department. And I, and I love my role in the private sector. I can go into that in a, in a later conversation. Excellent. Thank you. So I hope those of you that took a lot away from that, please take notes because you'll have a chance to ask questions. Melanie. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Kizu. Maybe it's been enough time, but I don't really have a lot of regrets or things that I wish that I had done. Um, if you are interested in a job in international development in particular, and you're thinking about it from um, working for a large INGO, an international um, non-governmental organization, then you want to think about getting overseas as quickly as possible, which is what I did in some form. It's um, a hard cycle to jump into where you need past experience overseas, but who's going to hire you without it? Um, and I think this is part of where volunteer opportunities come in, um, doing things over the summer that have more of a professional role to it. You're not just heading overseas for a summer for vacation, but you may be deciding to do research or working um, with a particular nonprofit organization that has programs that you're particularly interested in a region or area of the world. The sooner you can get yourself overseas, um, the better. It doesn't have to happen that way, but it certainly helps. Um, I would also say not having done a ton myself in or any really working for the federal government, I do know that there are a number of fellowship opportunities. If you're thinking about grad school and you're a person from an underrepresented community, you can apply, for instance, I think the Pickering Fellowship just opened. So that's at the State Department. They will pay for your graduate school with a commitment that you will then go into the State Department and serve. Um, Yes, thanks for that chat, that link. I think that um, application process just opened like a week or two ago. And that you will find many people of color in the State Department were Pickering Fellows. And so if you are have a, a contact within the State Department or know someone, um, you can ask for those informational interviews that are really key. Um, and there are particular things in that particular fellowship that are critical to think about. And I would say um, just affinity networks in general. And um, this is a great time, honestly, there are a lot of affinity networks out there for people of color in evaluation, for people of color in philanthropy. Um, if you're focused in a particular part of the world and you're a person of color underrepresented, there's likely an affinity group for you where there is a pipeline of people who have been through um, their, these sort of career things, wish they had known, and there's an entire network for it. So I was um, at the University of Denver. My job at the while during grad school was to work with one of these um, mentorship programs. It's called International Career Advancement Program. Um, they work out of uh, the Aspen Institute, the Center for International Studies, which is based in DC, and the Center for Foreign Relations, really thinking about the whole pipeline of how to underrepresented groups make both US foreign policy and international affairs reflect the diversity and the strengths of the US population overseas. Thank you, Melanie. Sarah, um, any thoughts on what you wish you had done um, throughout your career and or any thoughts about how you landed your opportunity um, to be on the Hill? Yeah, no, I uh, appreciate the question. The short answer is no. I mean, I think uh, there are no regrets. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, we, we kind of look back and say, oh, if I would have taken that job, um, there are a couple of those junctures, I will admit, in my career. There's an opportunity to work with a U.S. senator uh, who would eventually uh, be a candidate for president. <laughs> I wondered if, if I should have taken that juncture because he got really close to winning. 
Um, but all that being said, I think I uh, took all the right, made all the right moves, ended up where I needed to be. My time on the Hill, I, you know, much like the other women have described, you know, between the Hill, uh, the State Department, and then I would go on to work in the area of Washington, Nicole K Street. I think it's great for people in this field, um, you know, the field of public administration, public policy, communications, to look at those careers. Uh, I think sometimes people think, oh, I can only, you know, go into a, a U.S. federal agency as a civil servant. Uh, but as uh, uh, Kesey was saying earlier, there are opportunities. Like I was a, a presidential appointee uh, to go in and, and do a, a number of different things. I would say the Hill is great because you're in the middle of a lot of things. Uh, you meet the people you meet on the Hill end up becoming candidates for office <laughs> one day, uh, sometimes presidents uh, and uh, chiefs of staff to the president. I mean, you, the people you meet on the Hill, especially if you go to uh, Capitol Hill right after grad school, um, it's a great time. Um, you don't hopefully have too many responsibilities and so you can, make very little money, uh, work a lot, and meet uh, a lot of people in the evening and during the day. And uh, those relationships will frankly go with you through the course of your life. Uh, and you will just learn a ton. Uh, the Hill is where a lot of ideas get based. Um, it's where a lot of things also get stopped. <laughs> so you will have stories to tell, I think, for years and, and meet the people who are really gonna make things happen or who are making things happen. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. So um, a few more questions before we open it up. And the first is about what do you value about your current organization? What are some of the things you value about the current organization that you work for? And after you answer that question, I'm going to come back around and we're going to hopefully talk about skills. And what are some of the skills that you recommend this new generation of leaders that are in school now or recently graduating, what skills should they be sure that they have um, in their toolkit? So the first question is about what do you value about your current organization? Well, if I kick off here, by way of background, I work on uh, the Latin America team at an international strategic advisory firm. It's called McClarty Associates. It was founded more than 20 years ago. Uh, and it was really a pioneer in this field of sort of private sector diplomacy is a good way to think about it. Uh, what we do is advise companies, most of them US-based multinational companies with investment overseas, on how they engage with governments overseas. Often they're coming to us because they have a concrete problem uh, or, or policy change that they want to advocate for. Um, sometimes then those relationships turn into general international government affairs support um, for the government relations functions within those companies. Sometimes we're also helping companies enter a new market. Uh, it's the, the work is very diverse. What we all are are experts in our particular geographies that we cover. And we work with uh, companies in diverse sectors. So what we're doing is, is learning how, I mean, that's often the fun part, learning the client really well too and in and, and their business and, and really trying to help them do business in, the, in what can be complex um, business environments in emerging markets. Uh, some, you know, the, the past to how we all got here, my colleagues and I are quite different. I work with a number of former ambassadors and, and, and U.S. diplomats, but other colleagues are former trade negotiators or former journalists or former academics. Um, my case, as you know, I've done a mix of, of the legislative branch for the Center for Foreign Relations Committee. And then in my previous job, I led government relations at a U.S.-based um, business association of companies with interests in Latin America. Uh, I'd also lived in Latin America for several years, um, so I, we all have sort of that, that international experience, relationships to help companies open doors, et cetera. Um, so what do I value about where I am? Um, I mean, I, I think the work is fascinating. I like that every day is a little bit different. Um, responding to client needs can be very demanding, and, and but we all have quite a bit of autonomy in how uh, we manage the work and our schedules. 
Um, I've loved, of course, pre-pandemic, the, the travel opportunities. Um, it allowed me to, well, this work brought me back to a place I love a lot, Buenos Aires, where I spent several years living as a younger woman. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it, it's a mix of both the, the nature of the work itself, but also the people I get to work with. Um, I love being at that nexus of the public and private sectors. Um, and my colleagues are all you know, very interesting people. I like that I can specialize in particular markets in Latin America, but also be in a global firm and our staff meetings every week, we cover every region of the world. Um, that's, I mean, that's a little bit of, of what I most love. Um, I've, I've certainly really thrived in this, in this role and, and highly recommend even this is, a, this is, it's a rather niche area, but I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to do something in the private sector that, is a lot like what I could have done. <laughs> it's it's uh, going back to our previous question, what could I have done? Another path would have been the Foreign Service, but this has given me the advantage of not working in a large bureaucracy. Um, that is the disadvantage for me of the Foreign Service um, and having a little more control over my personal life, still being based in DC, but just traveling a lot from here rather than moving around. Um, I'll leave it at that. Nice, thank you so much, super helpful. Melanie. Yeah, so I'll explain a little bit about what the Disability Rights Fund does. So we are a pooled fund where we give grants out to organizations of persons with disabilities to advocate for their own governments to fulfill their obligations under a UN convention called the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and so our grantees are advocating anywhere for the building of ramps to be get into the hospital. Um, for women who are survivors of gender-based violence to have um, a sign language interpreter if they need it when they're trying to call the police, um, to women of, who are not being forcibly sterilized who live in institutions or similar to the <laughs> news in Brit right now with Britney Spears, like having certain rights taken away um, if you're having a mental health crisis. So, um, I value this, the organization I work for, for a number of reasons. It's a rights-based perspective on disability. And so it doesn't require medical diagnosis to understand that there may be social and structural barriers to the way that people engage with the world because they may have neurodiversity, a physical difference, um, or um, have an intellectual disability, um, or what's more, I think more accurately called a psychosocial disability, what we would call mental health um, issues here in the States. So um, my, I have an eight-year-old daughter. She has something called auditory hypersensitivity. And so her brain processes the world louder than it actually is. And in the midst of the pandemic, we've also realized she has something called heat intolerance where she gets overheated and emotional regulation becomes very challenging. Um, so I have a built-in community in my workspace, board members that ask me very um, insightful questions. We didn't actually pinpoint what was going on for her until several months after I actually joined the Disability Rights Fund. Um, in the midst of that, I actually only work part-time. I had been working full-time previously um, and needed to pull back from that. And I can chat about that a little bit later too, about what it looks like to make shifts in your career when your personal life needs more attention. Um, and so I have been valued at this organization, what I bring to the table, um, my perspective as a parent of a child with disabilities, as well as being a woman of color. Um, and in the midst of that, it hasn't stopped. Um, my career path and growth within the organization. Um, and that's continuing to grow, even though I have constraints on my time, will not work more than 30 hours a week and do not want to be supervising more than two people, which is, can be very challenging the um, higher up you go in your career. You will add responsibilities as your title grows, um, but there can be, again, constraints that need to be worked around. And the organization I work for understands those constraints and allows me to be flexible. Thank you for sharing that, Melanie. Very insightful. 
Um, Sarah, any thoughts on what you value about your current organization, your current role? Yeah, much like the the women on this call, I have, uh, and as I mentioned in my last response, I've worked in a number of different environments, right? From the public sector to the private sector. And so I'm currently working at my first not-for-profit uh, in my career. And uh, I chose that uh, this current position in this current organization because it, it wasn't a traditional 501c3. We're actually a 501c6. So we are, it's the same designation that a lot of associations and chambers of commerce have. And it's a bit different. It's almost like a hybrid private public. So if you're someone who's thinking about oh, I wanna work for an organization that's cause oriented, but I don't necessarily want, want to work for an organization that's just cause, uh, all it does is sort of cause advocacy, then a 501c6 or an, uh, an organization like that is a good hybrid. Um, we are a business organization. We've been around since 1937. So I value our tradition, but I also value the uh, move towards more diversity uh, in our community. So having a business group that reflects our community and the work. And so the Citizens Council, unlike the Chamber of Commerce and Commerces in the area, really focuses on these high level infrastructure strategic initiatives that keep the city of Dallas moving along at strategic points in time. So over the course of our time, we have led uh, infrastructure builds, we've led bond campaigns that have been crucial to critical funding for schools, the city, uh, and we've also really advocated on issues that are in the niche, uh, not so glamorous, if you will, but highly important uh, to have a position on and to make things happen. And so I value the diversity of the work I do. I do public affairs, so a bit broader, um, work in policy and uh, communications and community engagement. As I tell friends when they say, what do you do, Sarah? It's like, oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, if anyone used to watch the show Scandal, um, I'm not completely Olivia Pope, but uh, what I do is I uh, look out at issues that we're tackling and try to find the best tool in the toolbox to handle those issues. And so they, you know, you can't go at every issue with the same tool, right? So sometimes it's, it's more of a PR campaign. Other times it might just be a call to a high level stakeholder. It just depends. And so that's a lot of what I do and what takes up my day. Um, I work now for a very small organization. We're a staff of four. I'm number two to our CEO. And so I value flexibility in my time. Um, and uh, I value the ability to work at different ranges and work on different projects. Um, and also the people I work for uh, value me. I'm at a point in my career, and I'm not sure if the ladies on the call would agree, but uh, culture is, is now the biggest thing that I look for in organizations. Uh, performance, of course, and money is always good. No one's gonna turn down money, but culture and having uh, people that you work with that you care for who care for you and where you don't feel like you're in the hunger games every day, uh, I don't feel that way, um, is, is really top for me. And so uh, I feel like I'm in a good place where um, I'm valued, I value my colleagues, and I value the work. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. So in the essence of time, um, I'm still gonna pose this, this question, but students, I'm going to challenge you to post questions in the chat or get ready to raise your hand. I can definitely call on you if you have questions. Um, and so this one is going back to the skills. So if you could, in let's say 30 seconds or less, just identify for our students, current and recently graduated, any skills that you think they should have, demonstrate um, in order to be successful, and perhaps one quick tip on how they could develop this skill if they're limited in resources. So just give them one or two skills and just a quick tip. How can you develop that skill if you're limited with resources? And then we'll pause there and we're gonna open it up for questions. So maybe in about 30 seconds or less, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. I 
I would say off the top of my head, first, writing skills are very important in any profession, but particularly in this one, um, learning how to write well in, in English is very important, but coupling that, it, depending on what you want to do, with foreign language skills. Um, I've found that at least to be essential to my work. Um, and I speak Spanish every day, and I love that that's part of my job, uh, speaking and writing. Um, I would also probably add a third, which is just people skills. I mean, I mean, inter communication skills, uh, relationship building skills, that bucket, uh, you know, much at least of our work at McClarty Associates does revolve around relationship building. And that's, and that's really important. Um, that skill in terms of not only establishing a new relationship, but, but maintaining relationships. Um, you know, if you, a lot of their skills are, are things you learn in and outside of the classroom. Um, but uh, foreign language skills, obviously, sometimes do take some resources if you haven't grown up speaking a foreign language. Um, the best way, of course, is to spend time in, the, in that country. Um, but there are, of course, other ways. Um, and we, we live in such a diverse society that I think we have a lot of, a lot of resources right here in the US. I'll leave it at that. I know I'm supposed to be quick. <laughs> Great, thank you. Melanie. Sure, that's a great question. So I think most of you, if you're on this call already, you have great, what um, like the technical term is called code switching. You can move in and out of different groups, use what you can would be considered appropriate language in those spaces. And that is um, invaluable. And so I would say to con continue to hone that and think about how you unconsciously have had to do that when you leave your home and step out into a more mainstream world and think about what that looks like and how you've had to make those changes to work on that, that will help you, I think, in a lot of managerial skills that Kezia was talking about. When you manage up and you have someone um, that's supervising you that may not fully understand your perspective. And so what does it look like for you to think about how you have productive conversations um, with someone that may or may not be ready? To have those conversations with you. You can practice those on your family, frankly. You can, you will probably have similar family dynamics in that, that you are also then going to deal in your um, workplace. And um, that is a very inexpensive, but maybe challenging tip on how to do that. But I would also say as you advance in your career, most hiring supervisors, and I know this for myself as well, know that there's no one candidate that's going to have 100% of everything they're looking for. And so there will be on the job training. And part of what you need to do is advocate for yourself and ask for that training and say that that is something necessary um, that uh, to get to the next level, to get to the next step. If your job is asking you to do something outside of your current job description or even advancing what's already there, um, a really, um, important ways to think about what that professional development looks like. And that shouldn't be out of pocket for you. It can cost you some time, um, but it shouldn't be something that you're paying for yourself if it's required for on the job. Thank you, Melody. And I do have student a student question in the queue. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it to you quickly and then we'll go to the queue with students. Okay, I'll be relatively quick. I agree 100% with everything these women said. Um, I think we probably could all have a, a similar list. The only thing I would add is uh, problem solving skills. So critical thinking, I think, you know, that is something that you are taught in an abstract way, usually in school, but I will tell you in politics and policy and sort of the nexus of where things get done, um, the ability to work your way out of a problem that doesn't have a clear solution or may have multiple solutions is value, believe it or not. And something some, somewhere that a lot of people, even 4.0 students don't master. And so uh, that is how a C student can become uh, president of the United States or anything like that because they're quick on their feet. The other thing I would add is something that I've invested in over the last 10 years is leadership. I think as we look at a world where AI is, is set to become a dominant part of the workforce, I think people who can lead teams in various ways uh, is, is some people 
Sarah, we're losing you on this end. Okay, we're going to pause because we lost Sarah. However, I think Sarah, if you're there, wondering we've lost how to you. get that. I know a lot of your ship certification. Okay, can you hear me or no? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, we heard you. Um, you had mentioned critical thinking, problem solving, and leadership. So we'll pause there and I'll jump into the students. If that was that the answer? Uh, that was, and I just mentioned okay. the how, which was, you know, in a lot of policy schools where folks on this call have been to, like the Bush School had a certification program. I would also recommend as people advance in their career, they look at Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. I'm also a, a Marshall Memorial Fellow, um, which not only helps you learn skills from top leaders in the world, um, but also gain a network of leaders that um, can be quite helpful to you as you advance in your career. And that is it, Natasha. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sticking with us, by the way. And thank you all for your patience and flexibility with technology, with our panelists. We're very excited that all of you have stayed on. So we're going to open for questions. And Erin, I see your hand up. We, you are second in the queue. I'm going to ask just one person to answer the question, OK? Um, and then we can always roll back later. So this first question that came in is from the chat and then I'll go over to the students that have raised their hands. It's about techniques, tips, advice for the Department of State interviews. So if anyone has been through a Department of State interview, a quick technique or tip that you could leave with a student. Uh. I mean, as I mentioned, there's there are two different tracks, foreign service and civil service that are very different. Um, so I'm not sure which track the, the student is referring to. I know there were some links put up on the chat for foreign service. Um, and essentially it starts with a written exam. Uh, once you pass the written test, you go on to uh, write several essays. Once you pass that second step, it's an oral assessment of a day. Um, that oral assessment does include one component that's like an interview, like a traditional interview, um, but it also has uh, a group exercise and it has a written exercise. Um, it's a whole day affair. Um, there's a lot of information available online about this. To be honest, it's not test testing substantive knowledge, but rather um, a set of sort of critical thinking skills that the, and the State Department publishes the criteria on which they judge you um, for this oral assessment. Um, the written test does, it doesn't really test some sort of knowledge either, to be honest. Um, it's, it, except for some history and geography and, and basic background. Um, it, there's also just an English writing section. Um, that The oral assessment, the way you can best prepare for it is to go to a, um, the State Department offers sessions to prep for it and to understand, you do need to understand exactly what you're getting into that day, how you will be judged. Um, but it's not like you need to be cramming substantive knowledge. You need to, if you can practice that group session because it has some unique characteristics. Um, but that, that's essentially how it works. Then once you pass that oral assessment, it does take longer. This entire process is a very long one. You are then put on, um, well, then you first need your security clearance and your medical clearance. And then once all of that is done, you're put on a register and your rank on that register is based on your score on that oral assessment. So the oral assessment also dictates how quickly you may get an invitation to join an incoming class of foreign service officers. And it just depends on the needs of the State Department, how many people they invite in a given year. You have two years to be on that list and if you are too far down on the bottom of the list and they don't have enough spots open up, you may never even get an invitation to join. Um, so it is, like I said, a, a very long process, but I encourage anybody who's interested to take it because you can take it as many times as you want. And many people end up taking it multiple times. So you don't lose anything and it's, it's just it's good practice. That's what I would say. I don't know if any of my other panelists would have something to add on that. Thank you, Kesia. We are down to about 10 minutes and we got a a lot of questions. So that's always a good thing. Um, I want to turn to 
Um, before we jump into, Melanie is going to provide an answer when it comes to math and statistics, but Erin had her hand raised first. So can we jump to Erin and then we'll, we'll keep it going. Erin, you can unmute and ask your question. And if I've mispronounced your name, please correct me. Thank you so much. My name is Erin and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to the panelists and also the moderator and also EPSIA for hosting this event. I just wanted to ask, um, I've noticed that there's an ongoing shift in the job market where there's less emphasis on masters or advanced degrees and more on skills. So my question to the panelists is, how has an advanced degree benefited you and do you still deem it necessary for people who are looking to go into a career in foreign affairs? Um, I'll take it and uh, I'll, I have a somewhat of a controversial answer. Can y'all hear me, Natasha? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, you're perfect. Okay, just call me out if I'm not. Uh, I'll be as brief and Aaron, if you'd like more information, just, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, in short, I got my degree probably about, uh, I think I've been working about 10 years. And so I did it after having gained work experience and uh, in that sort of nexus between sort of pivoting in my career. I will tell you the job I got after uh, I had my master's in uh, public service and administration, they didn't hire me because of the degree. They hired me um, because of my connections, my network and my experience prior to uh, getting the degree. But I've told people that the degree helped me better do the job. Um, I do think there is that push. I'm glad you've seen that. Um, you know, as we've already said in this panel, your network, your relationships, how you manage those really is, it becomes this currency that allows you to move between jobs. I still want to be hopeful that having a master's degree is insurance for the world that lies ahead because so many of us will have degrees beyond bachelor's. And so, and I think degrees like MBAs and JDs and MDs, I think are still going to be valued because they're so technical. Um, but I do think if you're kind of hoping to get a degree to get a job, um, the degree won't necessarily get you the job in my opinion, but I think it will be good for you to have and for your own education long-term. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm definitely looking forward to connecting on LinkedIn as well. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Erin, for your great question. Melanie, please, there was a question in the chat regarding math, statistics in your careers and this person having a journalism background, just any quick thoughts on that? Sure, so that's a great question, Alicia. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. And I, myself, I work as in the field of evaluation. So I do a lot of statistical analysis. I basically answer the question, how do we know the money that was invested was worthwhile? So when I was in the peace building field, I was managing a conflict prevention project um, in West Africa and our donor wanted to know, did he prevent a war? Did his $6 million prevent a war, <laughs> right? So those are challenging questions to ask. And I think math skills will allow you to um, think about different analysis, uh, think through um, those particular pieces of what's valuable and what do numbers actually mean and what do they actually represent and what do they don't? What don't they represent? And if you get further along in your career, um, there will need to be basic budgeting and depending on who you work for, if you submit proposals and putting those things together and thinking about how to put your organizations or at least understand when someone presents you with how much money they're going to be providing for a particular project that you are managing or working on, it's helpful to understand those spreadsheets and the information that's being provided to you in any field. Um, because funding is important in any field, whether you're working for the government or a nonprofit or a foundation. Wonderful. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Billy, you're up. And then we're going to go back to the chat box. Um, Melina asked a question about failure. We're going to go to her question. Um, but Billy, you're up. Melina's next. And we'll keep going. <laughs> um, so I graduated in in 2019 and like my degree was in a different field than international affairs. So like um, my idea was to like hopefully get into like the Peace Corps or like the Fulbright 
uh, English teaching assistant program um, to like break into this field. But like, what happens if like I don't get in like accepted into those two programs? Like, like what else can I do though? So like get experience for like knowledge, etc. Would one of our panelists like to address that? Sure. So I can, Billy, if I can answer that, because I think a lot of return Peace Corps volunteers do end up going into the nonprofit development sector or head into the federal government as civil servants. Um, the UN has a volunteer program that they do. If you are thinking that your career path, because Peace Corps volunteers don't make a lot of money <laughs> and neither do Fulbright scholars. If you're thinking that you can make that sort of investment into the next couple of years, there are a number again of nonprofit organizations that have very reputable um, names in the international development field that will um, allow you to have a small paid stipend while you um, basically have a fellowship with them overseas. So I would say those are the programs that have more brand name and recognition and so are going to be rather competitive. There are a lot of other options out there depending on region of the world, what your undergraduate international affairs degree was in and where you think you'll be going, whether that's medical, humanitarian relief, human rights, um, just a wide variety. Wait, so um when like for the field of like government work like can you say that like you don't get paid that much either though like working for the government etc i think it depends right so it's it's varied and maybe kezia and sarah can jump in as well um but i would say most entry-level positions in any field um that unless you're going into the private sector or consulting banking um you are starting off at a lower pay grade um, so kezia do you want to no that's i think that's right yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. and then it just becomes relative you know, what is a lot to you and what is a lot to someone else, maybe two completely separate things. Oh. Um. Billy, we're gonna pause there, but I would also suggest that you can always connect with your career office, the coaches in your office, so you can even message me directly and we can have that conversation when it comes to salary based on what fields you're thinking about entering. That is information that the career offices have on record. We do employment surveys with our graduates yearly, and we look at what they're making in the field, outside of the field, in our countries outside, and we could be able to work with you more closely. So all of the career offices at your schools have that information, okay? All right, let's, um, thank you, Billy. Let's thank Billy for that question. Um, we got about three or four more in the queue. I'm gonna do my best. Um, I think it was Melina um, had a question about misses and failures and how do you, how have you moved on? Um, does anyone want to quickly share any quick tips on if you've had a miss or a failure on your job and how you uh, quickly rebounded? I think I see Sarah unmuted. Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. I'll be okay. quick. Uh, in short, I always tell friends, if you haven't seen his commencement, commencement speech, re, uh, uh, read the commencement speech or watch the video of Steve Jobs. Uh, people who fail, it's actually an addictive, it's a, a important part, important part of the formula for success. For me personally, yes, I have been, I guess, technically laid off from at least a couple jobs in my career. And mm -hmm. those periods of time, I will tell you, have uh, really made me stronger in the end. What you have to do if those things happen, which, you know, for many people I have, if you talk to them, they'll share those experiences with you. 
you really will begin to rely on your network and leaning into uh, your contacts and relationships as a way to kind of problem solve and think through solutions. And so it doesn't mean anything. Uh, I think if, uh, one of my cases, a lot of them, they were organizational issues that were beyond my control, like uh, the company was downsizing or, you know, sort of uh, parting in ways of values, things of that nature that are important to people. And so that happens in life. Uh, but what you have to do is you can't let it uh, get to you. you. You have to really think about the opportunity ahead. And in both cases, I rebounded bigger and better and um, am grateful uh, for the peri those periods of time because they allowed me to reflect, lean into uh, new contacts and networks and have given me the story to tell that I can share with you today. Thank you so much. So we have um, a student question. You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's me. Yeah. Um, this is um, for all three of our lovely panelists, but especially for Kezia and Melanie, who mentioned the importance of international experience. So, well, I grant, um, I graduated, from, I graduated from undergrad in 2016, and I am graduating from my, my master's program in at, at the end of this year. So I'm at the stage in my career where it's a little difficult for me to uh, spend un unpaid time getting valuable experience. How do I, but you've said essentially that international experience is more or less essential. How can I gain, how can I gain such, how can I gain such experience on the job, or 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 quickly enough for it to be for me for me to be able to transition into my my first position in this field? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if I totally understood the question, <laughs> um, but maybe if somebody else did and wants to chime in. Or otherwise, if you don't mind repeating, I'm sorry. Oh, um, no worries. I'm, I probably wasn't very clear, but get, I mean, on the one hand, there's a, there's apparently a a, a a cycle of you need a, you need a, you need international experience to get a job that gives you international experience. Mm -hmm. On the oh. other hand, there's the there you the, the other the other way of getting international experience is by volunteering, um, which. I'm not really in a position to do as a in and in and of it by itself. So, uh, how can I how can I how can I overcome the problem? This problem. Okay, understood. Uh, I mean, the way I I did it was through extensive study abroad um, and and even doing a, a master's degree overseas, which was actually much more affordable than doing one in the United States. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's hard to generalize, to be honest, and at least in my opinion, I don't, it, I would need to have a better sense of what you want to do. And within the very broad field of international affairs, there's so many different directions you could take. Um, if you're looking at the State Department, for example, there's no requirement that you have international experience. There's nothing, I mean, obviously it helps, it helps justify your interest in the Foreign Service. Um, there, you have to pass these exams to get into it. It's, and it's not, I mean, people often do it without having lived overseas or anything even close to it. Um, so it, I think it, it's hard to give you a very generalized answer. Um, it may be that you could get the job that gives you international experience first without necessarily needing it in advance, if that makes sense. I would just add one thing on to what yeah. you said, Kezia. I think yeah, you're exactly right. right. Um, to your question, I've worked obviously at the State Department covering international portfolios, but I also worked for an international company based in Houston. The mm -hmm. Well, the company was based in Geneva and I was based in Houston covering the Americas. So to Kezia's point, I mean, the other thing you can think about if you're based in the United States, there are a slew of companies with international presences all over the world. I live here in Dallas, Texas. We are home to one of the most Fortune 500 headquarters in the in the U.S., I believe, with many of them being global <laughs> companies. So you may want to just start with your backyard, really, and see, you know, once you get into an organization, your opportunity to really, like, move up 
and move around um, becomes easier because you're already within the organization versus ha trying to come in from England, like living here and trying to get a post in England from here, right? Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, we have, a, we have another student question. Um, and then after this question, we're gonna pause because I need to check in everyone with our panelists because we were scheduled to end at 4 p.m. and I wanna be mindful of their time as well. So um, we're gonna take our last uh, question. Um, first name spelled V-I-N-O-O-T-N-A. Uh, Vinutna, yeah. Vinutna, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank the panelists for such an amazing presentation. I uh, really appreciated it. So I am a current undergrad, or actually I just graduated from undergrad a couple months ago and was wondering a little bit about differentiating between the public and private sectors or as a recent grad, what would you like, what are the pros and cons or what would you suggest? And obviously I can connect with you all later for a better, uh, more, um, I guess, specific answer, but just kind of wondering about differentiation and like, some ideas for a recent grad looking for a job right now and either. Thank you. I can answer that really quickly. And congratulations, by the way, to everybody that's recently um, graduated and made it through the pandemic, um, trying to finish up your last year. I would just say that's a very hard question to answer for any one person. I think one question you might want to ask yourself are how do you want to influence the world and what sort of change do you want to be making? So if you're coming at it from a, a policy perspective, the benefit is that you are um, in the US and the US, as Kezia mentioned, has a lot of influence on its foreign policy and what happens in the rest of the world. Um, if you're thinking about it from more of an activist perspective and um, there may be some grassroots pieces that are really important to you and community-led change is what's critical for you and you have that deep value um, for that particular piece then that's important to look at or are you thinking about think um, like broader umbrella change through a philanthropic lens and investing in a particular um, I think Sarah had called it like a particular cause area um, and something that is very critical to you to open those doors um, I have found the most convincing and dedicated team members and for myself, there's some personal connection to the choices that you eventually make into your career. And that helps you in those harder moments where you do make a mistake or a team is challenging or there's a crisis somehow. Um, and you may even have a personality that thrives off of crisis and responding to crises. So then you might wanna think about humanitarian work and so those are all things that I think you need to reflect for yourself um, and no other person really could answer that for you or should be answering that for you. Thank you. Excellent. So I know it's hard to say goodbye. It is, and this panel has been amazing. So right before they give their final thoughts, um, I want to encourage you to keep these questions going because we got a whole week of programming with alumni that are going to be available to answer your questions. But right before they give their final thoughts, can we just get a, a few thumbs up or a few claps so we can see those coming up to thank them for their time? Because um, they've been they've been phenomenal. So if the panelists could just if there's a last word that you would like to um, share with the students before you go, just any, a, a final thought, a, a final word of advice, or um, some of you might wanna answer the question, why should they choose a career in international affairs and policy, if that's what you'd like to do, but just a quick final thought would be amazing. All right, Kesia? Just, uh... <laughs> I think, no, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed everybody else's thoughts. Um, I think something we talked about with Kadam at the very beginning that just keep in mind that careers in international affairs are very broad and diverse. Um, we've, I've talked quite a bit about the option of being a US diplomat, but there are so many other opportunities. And I think my own career has um, is a testament to that. Um, and so just if to the extent that you can take advantage of opportunities like these 
to the extent that you can speak with people from your alma mater who are doing cool things, um, really leveraging your networks to learn about the wealth of opportunities that are out there. Um, there's just, there's more than at least I knew about when I first started out on this track. Uh, I had no idea that even a firm like mine existed um, 15 years ago. Um, so there's there's more variety of opportunities out there than you think. And the, the more informational interviews you can do, the more panels like this you can do, the more informed you'll be. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Melanie. Thank you. Um, you know, I would just say more in terms of self-care and how you folks are doing this. If you're thinking about graduate school applications, job applications, those are challenging things and there will be honestly rejection that comes with it. You won't get 100% yeses. Um, and there needs to be built in some boundaries for yourself. Applying for a job 40 hours a week is not going to be helpful for you and your own mental health um, and your own life and how well you're doing and what, how you're able to bring yourself into interviews if you get to that stage. And so I just give advice to say that um, you will have a path in your life and it will be yours and um, it will be something that you can embrace for yourself to what Kizzy is saying. There are many different ways to, um, to care for yourself and for your family and to think about how you sustain yourself through a career. Excellent. Thank you, Melanie. Sarah, final thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I again echo everything these women have said. Um, there is no right way. I mean, I think the first thing everybody on this call just needs to be aware of, many graduates leave school thinking there's some path and everything is set out ABC and it's not. Um, all of us who have achieved success in our life have been through interesting roads where as Melanie described, there's a balance between your personal and professional uh, health and well-being. And so it, it is not it's not written in stone. And so what you've got to do is just frankly, start living and start trying out things that align with your passion and your professional uh, interests and your skills. The other thing I would say is, is really truly become a student of life. Um, I've traveled to all seven continents. I continue to travel. I've been to about 37 or 38 states, uh, about 25, 26 countries. I live, I learn. Uh, it's those cultures, those connections that frankly become uh, the currency of, of that and that help you move along. Um, there's lots of opportunities and soft skills, frankly, are more valuable than you may realize. Many of you are technical uh, geniuses, I'm sure, uh, but make sure you're also taking time to build the soft skills because those are quite valuable and unique as you will find out in the workplace. Thank you. And so to Apsia, thank you. I want to thank the speakers. We want to thank the speakers for being here. Attendees, this is when we will need your expertise. So don't leave us just yet. A survey evaluation poll is going to pop up on the screens and we really need your feedback. So please just take a moment and complete this survey, um, if you will. We also want to remind you not to miss the Tuesday sessions, an open chat with alumni, and a session coming up on building the confidence to compete for opportunities. Building the confidence to compete for opportunities. So please participate in all the programs this week. And thank you all once again, and enjoy the rest of your day.